So this is a important time. Let me adjust my... This is an important time in Buddhism uh, because we are approaching the full moon day of May, which is the Buddha's birthday. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Buddha as I understand him and why it's important that uh, we in, enjoy the festivities, but also reflect on the, on the fact that a human uh, achieved his full perfection through his own effort, his wisdom and compassion. There's a mythology about the Buddha, which, which I really like. I know some people are a little distracted by it, but uh, it said that... Uh, the Buddha's birth mother, Queen Maya, had a dream one night where a white elephant that had six tusks circumambulated her in the dream, and it turns out she was pregnant. Not quite the Immaculate Conception, but I, but I like that story. Ten months later, it took a little longer for the Buddha to be born. Ten months later, he, he, he was born out of her side rather than the more traditional way. And it could be looked at as a sign of purity uh, and a remarkable event, to say the least. The heavens opened and sweet tea flowed. That was the beginning of this guy. How cool is that? It said he was really uh, good at a lot of things. Uh, very good at meditation. There was a... Uh, uh, a harvest festival. He was a young boy, and uh, he was sitting underneath a tree, and, and he saw an apple, and he saw a worm emerge from the apple, and a bird came and plucked the worm away and ate him. And, and it's said that at that moment, Siddhartha, the future Buddha, realized how difficult the world is, that life and death happen all the time, every day, in a variety of ways, to say the least. Uh, at the age of 16, he had an arranged marriage with his cousin, Yashodara. And um, that's what they did back then. And it seemed to be a happy marriage. And at the age of 19, he had a coming-of-age experience, they call it, where he went into the streets of the city and, and saw the four things that forever changed his life. The, the old person, the sick person, the dead person, the holy person. So yesterday I was at uh, Leisure World in Seal Beach. And um, I, I like the old people because I'm old now. And, and we have a lot in common. And we watch each other try to walk across the room. You know? And it, it, you just sort of look at life in a much different way because the limitations are more obvious after a certain age. And, and they don't go away, they only increase. Uh, I know after sitting on the floor for an hour, an hour and a half, I, I grunt a few times before I get up just to get ready for the uh, <laughs> experience. <laughs> and, and there's a certain fondness about that. But in a way, our society, our culture, every culture, seems to hide these realities from us all the time. That that getting old is often ending up in leisure world or assisted care. And, and so the, the people in between young age and old age don't have to deal or think or look at the elderly. Uh, people that get sick, we don't want to look at them either. And so we put them in hospitals, and sometimes they have insurance and sometimes not. So only the caregivers and close relatives and friends get to see them. So we're we're saved from having to interact with them every day. And then the dead people, we don't get a chance to see them very often either because it's not something our culture wants us to think about or see. So when somebody dies, we cover them. And, uh, and then we send them to the mortuary where they dress them and comb their hair and put the makeup on and cover them with flowers so we can't smell the decaying flesh. And, and we think to ourselves, Uncle Max looks so peaceful. It's like he's just sleeping. Death isn't so bad. And, and so 
I imagine Siddhartha seeing this and, and having this being hidden from him by his father in the same way our culture hides it from us. It must have been just a big wake-up call. Like, whoa, this life that I've taken for granted is really special and very impermanent. And if I'm having a good day today, there's no guarantee it'll carry over into tomorrow. On the way back to the palace, it said, he saw a, a yogi, a mendicant, an ascetic, who seemed peaceful, almost in a state of bliss, in the midst of all the suffering that Siddhartha had just experienced. And he, he couldn't quite figure out how that could be the case. And he asked his charioteer, why is that man so peaceful after all I've seen today? And the charioteer said, well, he's a, a religious person and, and he's given up the worldly life and he's seeking the answers through practice and spirituality and religion. So for me, when I read the story the first time, that sort of planted a seed in the Siddhartha's mind that, that maybe the worldly life, even though he was a prince and scheduled to be the king, wasn't going to be all it's cracked up to be. So at the age of 29, after his first child is born, Rahula, stand, it actually means fetter or impediment, um, <laughs> He kissed his child and his wife goodbye and left them in the care of his parents and, and ventured off into the jungles and forests of India to find out what it was all about. And it took him six years. It took him like a really long time. So in the Theravada tradition, we have the full moon day of May is the birth of the Buddha. The full moon day of May is the day the Buddha became enlightened. And the full moon day of May is the day the Buddha died. It's really convenient for us. Get those three things out of the way in one day. So what was this enlightenment thing? Well, he had practiced asceticism and meditation, and, and it said he was a prodigy when it came to meditation and was able to go far beyond his teacher's but, but realized that the meditation he was doing, which was samatha meditation, tranquility meditation, only ended the suffering while he was meditating. And when he got off the cushion and went out into the world, he started to suffer again. And he realized this wasn't a permanent solution to suffering. This was simply temporary. So he thought to himself, maybe there is another way. And... He sat beneath the Bodhi tree, and some people say a really long time, some people say not so long. I like seven days because it's easier to remember. And he sat there, and, and what he did is he rediscovered insight meditation. And this is really important for people who are doing mindfulness or vipassana, is that he rediscovered insight meditation, which allowed him to achieve nirvana, that samatha meditation the tranquility meditation practiced by the yogis and ascetics of India at his time didn't lead to nirvana. And that's why there weren't any humans, male or female, who had achieved that level of perfection. The 28 Buddhas that preceded, or the 27 Buddhas that preceded Siddhartha, he's the 28th, also discovered insight meditation and also achieved nirvana because of that. So what did he come to understand underneath the Bodhi tree that transformed him? Well, after his nirvana experience, he was able to look back, they say, even 100,000 lifetimes. He could perceive or conceive all the times he had been born and died, and he could see exactly what he did and didn't do, and what led to his eventual nirvana that full moon day. But he was also able to look at the people around him and see 100,000 past lifetimes that they had and could see what he needed to say or do that would trigger their nirvana. Because we all carry it with us. See, we're all, we're all carriers of this nirvana. And, and we don't find it out there. What we do is we realize it in here. It's, so it's already with us. So none of us have to go to India to find nirvana. 
we can go to Melrose and find Nirvana. <laughs> so he was also able to see Paticca Samuppada, the 12 link chain of causation. And, and, and this is said to describe why and how suffering arises. Because of this, that arises. Because of that, this arises. And some people say this is how the world arises. And, and I think that's giving it too much credit. It's not, for me, how the world arises. It's how my own personal suffering arises. And, and what I need to do to end my suffering is simply break one of the links, which takes a few hundred lifetimes. Okay, so those were two big insights that he had. And, and he went into the world to teach what he had come to experience and understand to be true. And it wasn't a philosophy and it wasn't a religion. He was just telling people what he had experienced. It later became a philosophy because he had a bunch of monks who didn't have anything to do. So they said, let's write all this stuff down and do commentary on what he really meant. And we have that available to us today from Amazon.com. <laughs> so in his, the first person that saw the Buddha, can you imagine the first person? There's this little story, and the first person that saw him was just blown away because apparently he glowed, you know. And the person said, wow, are you an angel? Are you a god? Are you a deity? And, and the Buddha, being who he was, said, no, 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 I'm awake. I'm awake. And it really didn't mean much to the guy. And the guy said, well, maybe so. And he walked off. And, and I think the Buddha probably said, you know, I got to have a different spiel. This is not working. <laughs> you know? So he, he sought out the five ascetics he had been practicing with until they felt he had become rather weak and, and confused. And, and, and they, too, noticed something different about him. So he... They said, please, come down, sit, sit next to us and, and tell us what you've come to know to be true. What is your practice? Now, see, back then, they didn't say, what is your religion or where do you come from? The ascetics in the forest would say, what's your practice? You know, and how's it going? Well, they knew it was going really well because the Buddha glowed. And so he proceeded to give the very first talk that he ever gave, which is called the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, which is also available. And, and in that he said, I have discovered four really important truths. And the first truth is that this life is ultimately unsatisfactory. So when I, when I speak to young people, I was speaking to young people last night at uh, Sri Ratna Buddhist Center in Anaheim. This was the youth group. And I spend a lot of time talking to young people about how life sucks. <laughs> and, and it's important. It's a rather weird thing to start with, but it's important in the teachings of the Buddha because if you don't get that, you won't get the rest of the talk. If you think your life is really good, you're going to be missing something. And so when I came to Buddhism, I thought my life was really good. I had a job, I had a girlfriend, I had cool shoes, you know. And then I started to study the teachings of the Buddha, and I started to realize my life was terrible. I was so much happier before I came to the Dharma. And, and, and then I started to really look deep inside to see how screwed up I was, not ever realizing that before, which is probably a blessing in disguise. And, and then there was this couple year period of time where things were being restructured and moved around inside my head. That I was now having different reference points to, to attach to and I would now look at behaviors at one time being cool as being really stupid and, and I had to get rid of all my polyester shirts and buy cotton and I slowly progressed into NPR, <laughs> you know, and, and it took a long time because I, I, I had things in my mind that I thought this was the way the world was and these were the people that were cool and these were the people that weren't cool. And so I had to transcend, transcend all of that. Uh, and, and then 
And then I started to feel good again. I started to be happy, but in a different way. The happiness was, was at a deeper level, and it, and it had a, a, just a bit of peace and tranquility attached to it now. It wasn't the big highs and the big lows of the roller coaster ride I had been on before. It was more moderate and, and even and balanced. And uh, so the Buddha said we have to look at the world as being, as starting with birth. And, and I think this is absolutely right. Everything that we are aware of started with birth, started with creation. Now, there's the science of creation and there's the religion of creation. And, and I sort of like the science because it's, it's more interesting. It's on Cosmos now on, channel, on the Fox channel, and you can see it, you see. So it started with nothing. And that is like the most profound thing of all. All this started with nothing. So it's hard to wrap your head around nothing. But there was one moment in the history of everything where there was nothing. And then you might say, well, how long is a moment? As long as you want it to be. And then in the next moment, there was a massive explosion and things just expanded. And they're still expanding after billions of years. They're still expanding, and our solar system is moving, and our Earth is revolving, and we're all changing. And the Buddha said everything is in a constant state of flux and change. And I, and I looked at this episode of Cosmos, and I'm going, yeah, man, this is just like he was right that nothing stays the same at all, in just one moment, but moment doesn't have duration, so how long is a moment, and blah, blah, blah. And and then I thought to myself, in a profound sort of way, one night, I said, what would happen if all impermanence stopped? Just, you you had this, like, moment where everything just came to a, a standstill. What would happen? Nothing. That's what would happen. Nothing. We wouldn't exist. Nothing would exist. It would be back to nothing if everything stopped. So impermanence is a good thing, but it drives humans nuts. Because we find things and attach to things that we like the way they are, and then, before you know it, it's turned into something else, and we're a little disappointed. And then it's turned into something else, and we're really disappointed. And you go, wow. It could, this impermanence could be the root of all life and experience, and yet it's also the root of human suffering. Also the root of human suffering. So, life sucks because everything changes all the time, and we like attachment. I have started to translate the great works of the world in my own special way. So anytime I find the word love, I change it to attachment. Try it sometime. It blows your mind. You know? Oh, I love the world. I'm attached to the world. I love Mary. I'm attached to Mary. I love my car. I'm attached to my car. So, and it's not poetic. It's just a way for a monk to deal with not being in love. But, (laughs) but it also is a way of practicing kindness in spite of love and that's why I like Buddhism because it always has love and kindness connected so if you don't have love you can still be kind you know so he talked about birth and then he talked about old age and he talked about sickness and he talked about death and death and death and death and everything is dying all the time and billions of animals are slaughtered and eaten We go to war to kill other people, mostly men. 700,000 men, they say, died in the Civil War. 700,000 men died in the Civil War. Young, strong, and idealistic. They had a notion of how the world should be. And they were willing to fight and die for that notion. Man, man. Not to say that a bunch of women and dogs and cats didn't die as well. Just mass destruction. 
I don't know if this world will ever be a great place to live because there's so much death just waiting to take us. It's a miracle we're all here today. And if you took the freeway, it's even more of a miracle. So, and then getting sick. I was talking to a woman yesterday who has brain cancer for the third time and was sitting at Leisure World in her apartment and we're just talking and she has two beautiful cats. And, and what do you say? to someone who has brain cancer for the third time and, and isn't sure whether they want to live or not. Is it, is it time to go? I've got this team of doctors and caregivers who said, we have a new concoction, we have a new cocktail, maybe that'll help you. Do you tell them to fight on, fight death? Can anybody fight death? Can you fight your body? You know, it's just like, it's your body. And it's doing the best it can, but it's not a very good vehicle because it, it's limited by time. It's also limited by a lot of other things we're not even aware of because of genes and chromosomes. And who knows how long we all have. And do you come to that place in your life and say, okay, I've done as much as I need to do in this lifetime. It's time to let go of this life and get ready for the next life. And at your memorial service, do they call it the day he died or do they call it the day he was reborn? How do we look at that? It's just a matter of time. Death, old age, sickness, man. So now we're all depressed and we're looking at the world like the Buddha and you're going, okay. So the great doctor known as Siddhartha the Buddha gave us a prognosis. He said, okay, this is, these are the symptoms of your suffering, and you suffer because you have far too much desire and craving and thirst that will never be satisfied. Will never be satisfied. No matter how new your computer is, you know it's just a matter of months, if not a year, the next, the next one will come out. More memory bigger hard drive, faster processor, less money. And you go, damn, i got to get that one now. It's unending. And just when you think you find the best car, somebody steals it. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, and then you get this craving. I saw the commercial. I wanted it. Wow. So if we can get past the craving we'll get past the suffering. So the Buddhist path is to end desire and to end craving. And this is really sort of a paradox because would any of us have gotten up today if we didn't have the desire to get up? You know, so how do you get up in the morning with no desire? How do you have lunch with no desire? How do you do that? Wouldn't you just not eat if you didn't have a desire to eat? Maybe. Maybe. How do you do that? How do you go to work if you didn't have a desire to make money or to make friends or to make a difference? How do you do that? Apparently, when you achieve nirvana, you can still function and not have desire. So he said, the solution, the answer is nirvana. Nirvana. It is what every Buddhist wants to realize in this lifetime, or the next, or the next, or the next. Wow, the end of suffering, the end of desire, the end of craving. How peaceful would that be? And a lot of people say, how boring would that be? But I don't know if it's going to be boring. Maybe at 20 it'll be boring. Maybe nirvana is better suited for people that are over 40. I'm not sure. You know? You get all the other stuff out of the way, and then you go for nirvana. And then he gave us the prescription. He said, the Eightfold Path. He said, this is what you need to follow. And if you follow the Eightfold Path, you will end up ultimately realizing nirvana. Ending your suffering, ending your karma, ending all future rebirth. Now, this is the part that trips people out because ending all future rebirth? Wow. Why would anybody want to do that? Isn't existence the best thing in the whole world? 
How long was it before we existed? Forever. How long will it be when this life is over until we get to exist again in this same way? Never. So existence is a miracle and it is special. And why would anybody say, I do not want to exist any longer? Because perhaps there is a different way to exist that is not dependent on birth. Maybe there is a form of existence that is dependent on nirvana for its reality. Maybe there is a parallel universe that is unborn and undying, but none of our sense doors is our sense enough, sensitive enough to pick it up. Our sense doors only work if things change, which is really sort of nice because everything in the universe is changing all the time. It's all impermanent. So our sense doors are adequate for our position in the universe, but if we want to experience nirvana, our sense doors fall short because they need impermanence to trigger them. So we have to take it as a maybe or a possibility or with confidence that the Buddha knew what he was talking about that there is this place that doesn't require birth, therefore there will never be sickness, there will never be old age, there will never be death. Sounds like a nice place to be forever or not at all because nothing and everything have the same definition. Interesting stuff. Okay. Eightfold path, basis of the Eightfold path, morality, foundation, precepts, That's what builds into nirvana through meditation and wisdom. So it's three tiers, three levels. Sila, personal discipline. Samadhi, meditation. Panya, or prajna, wisdom. Cool. So as a Buddhist, we start building the foundation through speaking and acting more skillfully in the world. We start by changing our karma today in this very moment through skillful speech and skillful action. And eventually we start changing our mind through our meditation practice. What is karma? Karma is speech, action, and intention. You could look at the path of Buddhism as a karma karma changer. The whole purpose of Buddhism is to change your karma and eventually end your karma. So you'll no longer be able to produce it. And why is that so important? Because that is the very thing that migrates lifetime to lifetime. Our karma. Not our soul. Not our self. Our karma. Are we the karma? Is, is my identity stamped on my karma? Doesn't seem to be. Doesn't seem to be. Because there is really no me to stamp on the karma. The guy that got up yesterday, he was like really tired. And he just sort of dragged himself through two presentations and driving to Seal Beach and driving to Anaheim and meditating the night before. And he was saying to himself, I don't know for how long I want to do this. But the guy that woke up this morning, the sun was out, the cats were smiling. Yeah, he was ready for the Dharma talk. So who was the guy yesterday? Who's the guy today? Who's going to show up tomorrow? (laughs) And if it changes that fast, wow. So what is this karma? This is the karma that this mind and body process creates as the wake behind, following me through everything I do, whoever the heck me is. And then when this me finally finds its end, this karma breaks free, this process, and seeks out another life. Seeks out another life. So we're going to be giving all the stuff we've done in this lifetime to somebody we've never met. Can you do it? It's really hard not to be selfish in that way. 
It's really hard to be altruistic and say, I'm doing this for the next generation, for the next generation of me, whoever that's going to be. And will they, will they look at this karma that I've manufactured and thought about and practiced skillful speech and action, had good intentions, will they look at it as a gift from me? Will they look at it as being sacred? Will they be so grateful that they got this? They won't even know. They don't care. It just seems like their life. They were born. You know? Ah, uh, well... And yet, each day, you continue to create the legacy of who you were or thought you were so you can pass it on to the next you. Wow, cool. Meditation is designed to change the way we think, to get rid of our ignorance and illusion. We have three poisons, three roadblocks to nirvana. First one is greed, Pretty easy to get rid, of, get rid of greed. Just practice generosity every day. Every day, practice generosity. In some small way. Give time, give money, feed cats, whatever you need to do to practice your generosity. It's not about them. It is about you. Cool. Selfish, perhaps, but we're all interconnected and interdependent. So what I do for you, I do for me. What I do for me, I do for you. Yeah. To get rid of our hatred and anger, we need to have attachment and kindness. Love and kindness. Cool. Okay. So love everybody. Be attached to everybody. No aversion towards anyone. And always be kind. And to get rid of our delusion and ignorance, we have the Dharma. The Dharma allows us to see the world the way it really is intellectually and ultimately to experience it through our practice. The Dharma. Greed, hatred, and delusion, for a Buddhist, no problem. It just gives us something to do. That's why Buddhists are so tired all the time. They're working hard. (laughs) Every moment's a chance for practice. And the worst people in your life are the best teachers you're ever going to meet. Okay, so you get this meditation thing going, and you get this morality thing going, and now the wisdom comes. And the wisdom, threefold. The first one, we talked about impermanence. Second one, we talked about suffering. Wow, anicca, dukkha. All things change, life sucks. We got that. Third thing is, I don't exist in the way I think I do. Anatta. That there is no me here. Never been, never will be. It's the illusion of self and ego. It's a wonderful illusion. It allows me to leave this room. If I was one with the door, I'd be here forever. But because I'm separate from the door, I can interact with it, open it, and leave. Because I am separate from the world around me, I can manipulate the world to a certain extent to meet my needs. Wow. Cool. Okay. But it simply is an illusion of separateness that in the big picture, in the ultimate reality of Buddhism, we are always interconnected and interdependent and never separate. And it takes a while to get there, but we can't live there. We, can't, it's, it, we need to be separate. We need to have an identity. We need to have a driver's license. We need to have these things that identify us as a being separate. And people feel really comfortable because we are separate from them. They may not want to be attached to us in that way. So we are in conspiracy with everybody not to be attached to each other. Yeah, okay. We have names. We have identities. We have ways of identifying ourself when we don't look like ourselves. There's Jim, and there's Steve, and there's Bob, all those people who are really me, reflecting me right back to me, but I can't say that because they're going to say, oh, Kusla, he's he's gone now. (laughs) He's given too many talks. So I got to just pretend I'm separate and go, hey, good to see you, you know? (laughs) 
So when we come to this place where we understand, really through personal experience, that everything changes, life ultimately is unsatisfactory, and I don't exist in the way I do, this attachment, this love for everything we have, starts to fall away. We become less and less detached. Not in a bad way. We're still there. We're still connected. But we don't have the craving that attachment oftentimes brings us. We don't have this desire that can just distort the way we perceive the world. Because now we have this balance. And rather than being attached and controlling, we're sort of allowing the universe to use us, and we're not using the universe. And so, wow. What does that lead to? great peace and serenity. And we can find ourselves in any situation, no matter how bad or how good, and not have to be a part of it. Not have to be. But of course we are, and we can function at a much higher level because we don't have the same investment everybody else has. You know, some of the... There's this, this ship that overturned in Korea with the children. It's just so sad. But the adults told the children not to do anything. You know, stay in your cabin. There's no problem. And the person that's not attached to that kind of authority would say, hell, I'm getting out of this cabin. <laughs> I'm jumping. You know, you have two million men going to war, and then that one guy that says, I don't know if I'm going to go to war. You have another 5,000 people saying, hey, let's do this. And then one guy says, nah, I don't know. Does it bring happiness? Does it bring peace? Am I going to be more tranquil? Is it skillful? So one of the functions we have as a Buddhist is to be an option to all those people out there who don't have options, that we can stand apart and together at exactly the same time. We are like a bunch of cats in a colony, and they all have their space, but they're all connected. That's cool. So as Buddhists, we sit together in a meditation alone. We sit together alone. And what a wonderful place to be, that we don't have to lose our identity or our value system or our idealism until we're ready, that we can be our own person but still be a functioning part of community. Because unity, unity is more important than uniformity. So we praise the Buddha. We look at him as a very special person. We look at him as an ideal, and we all have the same possibility, our Buddha nature, potential to achieve what he did. He did it through hard work and practice, commitment, wisdom and compassion, we have to do that too. And in our practice and in the process of becoming, we never ultimately end up being anything. And it's okay. <laughs> so having said that, does anybody have any comments or questions they'd like to share? Yes? Am I practicing in the wrong Well, there are 44 different kinds of Buddhist meditation. That's one of them. Mantra recitation is definitely one of them. Really useful to have a mantra because what happens is we have this sort of train of thought that never gets derailed. And the mantra is like a sharp knife that cuts the train into a million pieces. Never lets a thought get very big or very complicated because you have this recitation going on. That's not a bad thing. That brings you peace and happiness. It may not bring you nirvana, but maybe you don't need nirvana right now. But you do. Okay. Well, there's a monastery right down the way. No. <laughs> yeah, it, 
You know, for me, this 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 is how I sort of did it. I, I, I went, I did the samatha stuff, the tranquility and the happiness stuff. I loved that. And then I started doing the vipassana stuff. And I became really agitated and disliked most people in the world. And then I went back to doing the samatha stuff, and I loved everybody. And, and I thought, for me, the samatha, the tranquility, really works well. Because it gives me the kind of balance I need to go into the world and not be too critical, and not be too judgmental. But I found when I did the, the Vipassana stuff, man, I got so critical. Mm-hmm. I just get right down to the, you know, building everything out of nothing. And I'm going, I, I don't know if that's good for me. Will that take me ultimately to nirvana? Yes, it will. But it's sort of the long way. You know, you got the plane, and you got the train, and, you got, and you're walking. I'm sort of walking, you know. And it's fine. Because along the way, I'm easier to get along with, and my life is better. So, so what was the Buddha doing? All well, 42. well, the Buddha, uh, the Buddha did samatha first, samatha meditation first. He did one of the forty kinds of tranquility meditations first, because that is what was being taught. Then the Buddha rediscovered insight meditation and achieved nirvana. When he achieved his nirvana, he never did insight meditation again because he had reached the end of it and succeeded. But he continued to do samatha meditation until he took his last breath. Now, why would that be the case, I said to myself. A man who achieved nirvana and he still meditates every day? What's the point? The point seems to be that this samatha meditation brings our body back into balance. It, it has the potential to anesthetize pain has the potential. Now, because of the Buddha's vipassana and insight, he never suffered with this pain. But he still had pain. And if you read some of the later sutras of the Buddha speaking to Ananda, he would say, I'm tired, I'm 80 years old, let's sit and rest. The Buddha had to rest. So it led me to see that nirvana does nothing for our body at all. Yoga, nutrition, vitamins, better. Nirvana is about our consciousness and about the transformation of consciousness. So he continued to do samatha meditation to anesthetize and bring his body back into balance. And when he died, he went into the fourth jhana, which is the deepest level of tranquility. So I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't that be cool when I'm dying if I could go into those deep levels of tranquility? And the Tibetan Book of the Dead speaks about them in a certain way as well. Different things that, aspects of deep states of concentration that may be available to you as your consciousness starts to disintegrate and you get to watch it disintegrate. Wow. And then what happens? Rebirth. So there's nothing bad or good about the 44 kinds. The 44 kinds of meditation, four are designed to get you enlightened, pardon me, to achieve nirvana, 40 are designed to get you enlightened, and all of them will be a benefit to anyone who does them. Helpful? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, Aaron. Um, what's the difference between the samatha and the insight meditation? What's the difference? Yes. Okay. Uh, This is uh, my uh, definition. Uh, Samatha meditation uh, is designed to bring you to a place of the direct experience of the interconnection and interdependence of all phenomena. Samatha meditation is designed to bring you to a place So you can experience the interconnection and interdependence of all phenomena. And Vipassana meditation is designed to bring you to nirvana. So there are four levels of nirvana, according to early Buddhism. First level is stream enterer. Second level is once returner. Third level is non-returner. Fourth level is arahant. Four levels of nirvana. I make a distinction between samatha and vipassana as one leading to enlightenment and one leading to nirvana. So in the Mahayana tradition, nirvana is not held as the primary goal. 
in Buddhism. It is enlightenment. It is the bodhisattva ideal. If nirvana ends all future rebirth, we are not able to fulfill the bodhisattva vows of saving all sentient beings. So in the Mahayana tradition, they work diligently at acquiring enlightenment, which allows them to be reborn forever as a human and be of service to all humans who are suffering and all humans suffer. The nirvana of the Buddha allowed him to achieve nirvana and all future rebirths and his karma and his suffering while he was alive. So we pick. Do I want to come back and be of service to all sentient beings forever? Do I want to end my suffering now? And we have these two different paths. The path of the, of the Theravada, of enlightenment, or pardon me, of nirvana, is the therapy aspect of Buddhism. And the path of the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva is the religious aspect of Buddhism. And um, for me, the irony and paradox of Easter is the fact that Christians come together to celebrate the fact that Jesus uh, arose out of his grave and went to heaven with his father. And the Buddhists celebrate the fact that the Buddha is dead and was never reborn or went to heaven again. <laughs> so you look at these two things, you go, wow, what's, what's wrong with the Buddhists? But the Buddhists don't have an eternal heaven. They have a temporary heaven. So even if we are resurrected and end up in heaven, we're going to have to leave sooner or later and suffering starts again. So our option is nirvana. That's just sort of a thumbnail of uh, the difference. Does that make sense, Sarda? Okay, thanks. thanks. Yes, sir? Oh, yes. Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. Yes, Avalokiteshvar, while practicing deeply. The Prajna Paramita clearly saw that all five skandhas are empty and pass beyond all suffering. I like Kuan Yin. We have many Kuan Yins at our center. Um, it's, it's the ideal of compassion manifested in, in statue and prose. And, and it is real for a lot of people. We have a Vietnamese man named Nam who comes to our center, and, and, and he made his way to the West on a boat where many people passed away. And he saw Quan Yin on the railing of the ship. And he knew after seeing her that he wasn't going to die that she would allow him to stay alive. And, and he saw her. Now, is Kuan Yin real? Absolutely. But in the context of a story, all the facts are real. I think of Kuan Yin as being a mirror. So when I look at a Kuan Yin statue, what the mirror is reflecting is my own potential for compassion and I always fall short. But I look in the mirror again to remind me that it is a potential, is a possibility. If one is practicing Mahayana Buddhism and Kuan Yin is real and one is having a tough time, uh, one will petition Kuan Yin because Kuan Yin made a vow to end the suffering of all sentient beings as well. And, and it works. Uh, Faith-based practitioners have access to that. I, on the other hand, never had faith. I made Kuan Yin into a mirror reflecting my potential. And when I suffer, I say to myself, look what you've done to yourself, Kusala. <laughs> you have to be more skillful. <laughs> so it's sort of that kind of thing. But it's wonderful. When, when, when you read her story and, 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 and see the see her in painting and form. It's just, she's beautiful. And, and it's, it's like the, the ultimate mom who's there to, to wipe away the tears and take away the pain and suffering. You know? Thanks. Rick. Um, I'm going to kind of mix this up and preface, preface, preface it with the, uh, the comment about the Buddha reached nirvana and so all his attachment to Dharma. 
And it, it, it confused me a little bit when we get to uh, the self and the self arises from the attached, from clinging to the five aggregates. Well, suffering arises. Self arises for another reason. Self arises from what? What does self arise from? I love that. It's, it's, uh, self is, the, the Buddha defined us, humans, as five aggregates or five skandhas. So we have form, sensation, perception, volition, and consciousness. Those last four have to do with self. The first has to do with body. So the only suffering comes in when you, the self arises just from the aggregates? Um, self arises because of contact with the world. And self can arise internally as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Self is a tricky little guy. So the only problem is clinging to the sense of self? I think the, the, the major problem is the identification with self. That, that, that it's us. It is, it is my suffering. It is my car. It is my life. So if you acknowledge those as it's you going out the door driving the car. So the problem only comes in No, it's. I, I wish that was the case, because they probably could devise some medication for us to take. It it seems to me that um, it's this identity is necessary. That we uh, would be less functional if we didn't identify with self and being someone. That we'd have to have caregivers. If you look at people that have Alzheimer's, they've lost their self. Self has, you know, disappeared, and they're non-functional for the most part, and eventually die. So, so we, I don't look at self as being a problem if it's not the master. Self becomes a problem when self is a master. But could I use self as a tool to skillfully work my way through the complicated world? And having self as in that mindset, seems to be beneficial and allows me to suffer less. But the suffering doesn't stop until nirvana. And is there a self in nirvana? There seems to be. The Buddha was very dynamic in what he spoke about and what he did. So it doesn't sound like he, his self died, but it sounds like maybe he had a different relationship with it after his nirvana. It's a tough one to answer. It requires a lot of thought, I guess. I'll keep thinking. There we go. There we go. Well, our time is uh, almost up. How about a loving kindness meditation? And uh, thank you all for taking the time and making the effort to come and listen to me speak today.